Welcome to DIA Today, Democracy in America Today. I'm Matt Parks alongside Dave Corbin. Glad to have you with us as we explore the ideas behind today's headlines. special episode today, Dave, our first guest professor. Yeah, a really great guy who I met, um, I think a couple years back uh, when I was at King's, he came and visited uh, our college. He tends to come around to different colleges uh, of our ilk. And, and then I've gotten to know him a little bit more uh, this past year. Uh, his name is Pete Peterson, and he's the Dean of School of Public Policy at Pepperdine University. He's also a senior fellow at the Davenport Institute for Public Engagement and Civic leadership and co-director of the American Project uh, at Pepperdine on the future of conservatism that was founded in 2017. So uh, when we were going back and forth, uh, as we wanted to open the show up uh, to guests, uh, Pete was someone who immediately came to mind. Uh, A lot of what we're trying to do deals with kind of uh, furthering the idea of lowercase r, uh, Republican civic engagement, and that's certainly uh, an effort that uh, Pete is a great part of uh, at Pepperdine. I'm just ha- really happy to have him on the show. So, uh, Pete, how are you doing today? Real good. Greetings from Malibu, California. You have to say that. Malibu, California. That's <laughs> of right. course. So. Of course. I haven't always been able to say that. So you take your, you take your shots when you can. <laughs> so for every other professor in the country, uh, when, if you ever get a chance to drive by Pepperdine and, and look at where it's located as it looks over the ocean and is perhaps the most gorgeous setting for any college or university in, in the world, you say, wow. Now that would be a gig. So uh, yes, uh, Pe- Pepperdine <laughs> is a great, a great gig. But um, uh, tell us, Pete, how you got to Pepperdine. So, you know, where'd you study? What did you study? And yeah. you know, what was it about Pepperdine in particular that, that um, drew you there and, and kind of what you're doing there and, and all that? I was mentioning to Matt before we started recording that I actually hail from the New York metropolitan area. I was born in Manhattan, grew up in New York, um, took a rather circuitous route across country here. Uh, undergraduate, went to George Washington University in DC, and then uh, coming back to the New York metro area, my career really began in the private sector. Worked in marketing and advertising in the New York metro area for the better part of 15 years. Went through what I can only describe as a early onset midlife crisis, which was (laughs) the occasion of 9-11. I was in New York on 9-11 and was 35 years old and came to a place where I really began to uh, question whether I could see myself doing what I was doing in light of what was happening all around me uh, for what God willing would be the other, the next 30 or 40 years of a career. And I just couldn't see it. Um, I'd always had an interest in politics. Um, obviously, 9-11, it made my world very large, just realizing as much as New York is a metropolitan city to go through the 9-11 experience and have people I know who were killed there, it at least helped me to think about the fact that uh, the questions that I had been wrestling with, um, particularly ones around calling, around faith and politics, were ones that I probably should spend some more time studying and exploring. Um, So within a year or so, I began applying to graduate policy and political philosophy programs, was very close to going back to my alma mater in D.C., Um, but I happened to have married a California girl, and as we were going through these deliberations, my in-laws, my wife's parents, who live in Orange County, California, uh, said with, with more than a little self-interest, you know, we've got this graduate school out here and you might want to bring our daughter back. At least that's, that's, <laughs> nice. that's how I remember that conversation. <laughs> smart, and, um, smart man. Pete. I didn't know Pepperdine from a hole in a wall. I mean, you, you're growing up as a kid in New Jersey. Nobody you know has ever gone to Pepperdine. You don't really know much about it. Uh, But on that next trip out to see my in-laws, it turns out that they had friends that are very involved at Pepperdine and gave us kind of a blue ribbon behind the scenes tour of not only the campus, but also got to meet uh, several of the faculty and learn a lot about this program. And having 
explored these DC based or DC to Boston corridor based programs. I was also pretty close to going to NYU Wagner, which is, you know, the policy school there um, and seeing what Pepperdine had built. I came to see the real difference in that program. I mean, Pepperdine was, was essentially developed uh, by the late great social scientist, James Q. Wilson. And he had created and helped design this curriculum based uh, pretty closely to the book he had just written at the time. This was 96, 97, uh, called The Moral Sense. Many consider his kind of magnum opus in many ways. And it was in The Moral Sense that Wilson makes the argument after you know, 30 years of social science quantitative research that much of the ways in which policy decisions actually get made in the public square not only have a quantitative aspect to them, which can be researched, but there's a real human dimension, which sounds obvious, I know, to you two, just given your own interest and this, and this podcast, but to many people in the public policy field, which had, and I would argue in many ways, continues to become highly technocratic as a discipline. This was really groundbreaking stuff. And so that happens to be where my proclivities lie, the studying of history and political philosophy. Uh, the quantitative side is kind of the broccoli that I have to eat along with, <laughs> you know, the rest of that. But learning more, we came, my wife and I came to the decision, we were going to pull up stakes from my job in New Jersey, drove across country, and enrolled here back in 2005 and uh, fall of 2005 and spent two life-changing years here, which set me on a much different course, uh, which we can certainly explore, but suffice it to say, a new career in policy and politics, ran for office in 2014 and coming back off of that, um, the opportunity availed itself to, I was asked, uh, by the president to first serve as interim dean here after our founding dean retired and um, got through the search process and have been dean here for the last four years. So very, very grateful to be leading a program that has really changed my life. And I think in many ways for, in, in ways that you two would certainly appreciate this this balanced approach to policy and politics, which includes the quantitative, but also the historical and cultural and philosophical. That's the thing I really just love and appreciate about this program. Yeah, I have a student uh, for the audience, uh, Paul Jimenez, a, a King's College student who you taught also, Matt, uh, who's currently uh, at the program and, and absolutely loves it for just that reason. Uh, I, I think back uh, to that great line uh, that Harvey Mansfield gave in his Jeffersonian address where uh, for so much of the 20th century, uh, public policy, political science has approached important questions, who gets what, when, and how, uh, when the reality is that so much of the question relies upon the who and the complexity within the human mm. condition. Mm. You can only get at, you know, through that study of humanities, history, and, and philosophy. So what a great opportunity uh, for undergraduates uh, to, to further their, uh, their graduate studies. Uh, where do most of the students who go through the program at Pepperdine, where do they end up? Are there uh, certain tracks or were there yeah. places of interest that, that uh, folks would be interested in? Yeah, so there's a, it, it is a master's in public policy degree, about 20 months. And in looking at where our graduates go, we describe it as more of a, a cross-sector leadership degree in that almost a third, a third, and a third of our students looking back over our alums go into either government at all levels from local up to Capitol Hill. Uh, a third go into the nonprofit space. So that can be think tanks um, or policy related focused nonprofits. And then a third go into the policy related private sector, corporate communications, lobbying, government technology firms, and then taking a, sl a sliver out of each one of those, about 10 to 12% each year of our students go on for PhDs. Um, and that can be an array of fields because it's, we do take this liberal arts approach. And so while we certainly have some go on for PhDs in public policy, we have many that go on for PhDs in political philosophy, economics, um, political science. I know one of the things that you've spent a lot of time thinking about, writing about, and conversation around is the issue of viewpoint diversity. Mm. And uh, just last 
August. There was an important statement on that, the Philadelphia Statement on Civil Discourse and the Strengthening of Liberal Democracy. It's a mouthful, but I, I love the way <laughs> put that together, right? Civil discourse, yeah. we can do civil discourse, and we can also do liberal democracy. We can have civil discourse and disagreement. We can have a range of views. Yeah. So you are one of the, the key public signatories for that statement. And I just want to, for our listeners, read one paragraph from the statement that I think kind of captures its spirit. And maybe you can talk about how you got involved in that and your overall interest in this topic. There's a third paragraph in the statement. It says, if we seek a brighter future, and obviously the context is cancel culture and speech mm. codes and all the rest. Mm. If we seek a brighter future, we must relearn a fundamental truth. Our liberty and our happiness depend upon the maintenance of a public culture in which freedom and civility coexist, where people can disagree robustly, even fiercely, yet treat each other as human beings, and indeed as fellow citizens, not mortal enemies. Liberty is meaningless where the right to utter one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist, Frederick Douglass declared in 1860. Indeed, our liberal democracy is rooted in and dependent upon the shared understanding that all people have inherent dignity and worth and that they must be treated accordingly. Really powerful, I think. Mm. Again, bringing together these ideas of, of civility and, and respect for human equality, and yet side by side with diversity of opinion and a recognition that we're going to have different views and yet we can, we can get along, or at least we've done that in the past. Right. right. How, how do we move forward on this, do you think, Pete? Well, I think it's going to take a lot of time. <laughs> and It's going to take a commitment. You know, how I got into this, even this field or set of interests, a friend of mine, John Shields, who's a political scientist over at Claremont, let me know that he was working on a book with his uh, friend and co-author, Josh Dunn, who's at Colorado, uh, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And he told me, uh, this was probably about six or seven years ago, that it's going to be looking at these issues around viewpoint diversity in academia and specifically the challenges that conservative faculty face. And um, his interviews began actually at the policy school because we actually happen to have and employ that unicorn known as a tenured conservative professor. <laughs> and... Um, and I got to learn a lot more about the book as it was going, and John and I just stayed in touch. And then we hosted a book release event when he, when he did it, and I've done several since featuring um, faculty members who have frankly gone through extremely difficult times. Just as one little window into that, the, the book consists of, of, I mean, it's an Oxford Press book, right? So it's an academic book uh, called Passing on the Right that Shields and Dunn co-wrote. They interviewed about 150 faculty members for the book. Not a single name or university or college is named in it. That's so it's the, know, yeah. it's the English professor at the Big 12 school. It's the political scientist at the Ivy League school. It's, you know, and it, for me, who obviously always thought about academia being on, on the left, it was a real, the opening of a window into a dimension that I, didn't, I don't think I fully appreciated. And, and so that was at the faculty level. And then as I moved more into administration here at the policy school and began recruiting students, I then began to see what students were facing. And it was a major learning to, and this is, this is probably gonna be obvious to both of you, but I, I have to say as someone who did not start in academia uh, as part of my career, understand how much the world has changed for both conservative faculty and students in the last 10 years, realizing how dramatically it's changed since I was an undergrad back in the late 80s. I had to, be, I had to face that. I had to speak with students and faculty to really get a sense of how much had changed and how difficult it had become. And so it really became a passion for me. I think there's a part of me that I don't, I don't know if it's a, you know, a part of my DNA or not, but when I, when I see people going through, frankly, oppressive experiences, that really gets under my skin. And so in these last few years as Dean, we've, if you go to the Pepperdine, the policy school website, we highlight viewpoint diversity as a major pillar of what we do here. And of course, for us at the policy school, this is important because 
unlike a business school, uh, we're preparing students to go off into the public square, to engage in politics or policy. So it's, it's actually more important for us that we're exposing our students to different points of view and to hear the stories of our students that have gone to really good undergraduate programs, but have nonetheless never heard a conservative perspective in their classroom discussions, I think, I think is something that we all really need to be disturbed by, frankly. Yeah, now, now you wrote a piece about a year and a half ago called, Is the Eggshell Culture on Campus Moving into Our Public Square? The first time I read that, I, I read it as egghead. I thought that can't be that bad. <laughs> but, but no, eggshell, the eggshell <laughs> culture on campus. And so this is the next step of this, right? Yeah. I mean, you can walk us through the piece, but we're talking about the professors, the students, right. and now the public square. You know, this was a theme I first heard written about by Victor Davis Hanson, who's uh, at Hoover, but somebody who's taught here as a visiting professor on a, a couple different occasions. And he was looking out at just how polarized the country had become and wondered whether there wasn't some relationship to the campus environment, which he had seen firsthand at Stanford. And of course, I had, I had been speaking to enough student groups and had gone through, you know, this experience in, with this book launch with uh, John Shields and Josh. And I was just seeing many of the same things. And then I, there was a great research, a survey research study done by a, a group out of the UK, but it was of American voters. And it was profiled, I remember, by a piece, in a piece by Yasha Monk in The Atlantic, probably about three years ago, in which the number one finding across racial, ethnic, household income, educational attainment, the number one malady facing the American political culture um, coming out of this survey was an immensely broad-based agreement on the problems of what they would describe as political correctness. This feeling that you would say the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong person completely innocently, but that to me is something I've heard student after student after student tell me that they have gone through that experience of either critiques or attacks by faculty members, fear of posting the wrong thing on social media right. um, that might bring not only opprobrium from classmates and friends, but even from the administration. And this to me, again, I think could be mirrored in some of the things that we've seen in protest and otherwise, this cancel culture, as you said, which seeks not to understand, but to terminate. And that's, that's not, that probably sounds like a too strong a word, but I mean, that's essentially what, what I've seen. And of course, a democratic culture cannot survive. And, and frankly, liberal arts education cannot survive that kind of environment. Yeah, Pete, I, when, when you say this, it's, it's to me always the case, especially in colleges and universities, that, that the pinata that you're asked to strike is the American regime itself. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a question of, will you pick up the stick and, and hit it? If you don't, you don't hit it hard enough, then, uh, then there's something wrong with you. And uh, I know that another scholar that has uh, been out there at Pepperdine is the great historian Winfrey McClay. And yeah. it's a paragraph uh, near the end of his, um, his great history of America that I just want to read and get your take on, because I think it's in line with what you're saying here. He says, this book, the history book he's written, is offered as a contribution to the making of American citizens. As such, it is a patriotic endeavor as well as a scholarly one, and it never loses sight of what there is to celebrate and cherish in the American achievement. That doesn't mean it is an uncritical celebration. The two things, celebration and criticism, are not necessarily enemies. Love is the foundation of the wisest criticism and criticism is the essential partner of an honest, enduring love. We live in a country, let us hope, in which our flaws can always be openly discussed and where criticism and dissent can be regarded not as betrayals or thought crimes, but as essential ingredients in the flourishing of our polity and our common life. Well, we had Bill here, and Bill's been a friend for a long time. He's taught with us twice as a visiting professor, and most recently this past academic year as our Reagan professor. And 
I had him uh, as the Reagan professor. We have an annual talk that he gives at the Reagan Library, which is just over the hill here in in Simi Valley. And that particular argument, which I think is is a powerful one, you know, I think you pulled a, a a particularly important quote about the importance of love, and and love is not uncritical, as Bill says there, and that civics education uh, should be about engendering that love, because in that, 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 that love of the place in which we live is not one that is uncritical. In fact, we will reform ourselves, I think, best if we do it out of love than out of hate. And so when Martin Luther King calls the Declaration of Independence a promissory note, essentially what he's saying is he is loving the founders and then calling the rest of America to live up to those ideals that he, King, did not create. And so the attacks on the founding, which are in many ways attacks on the American identity seen more broadly or the American experiment, are ones that ironically will not lead us to a place, I think, in which we'll experience the reforms and progress that I think the vast majority of us can all agree have been made and are continuing to be made. But it, it needs to start from a place where we can love one another and, and love this experiment out of which the guardrails are set for progress and reform. So let's maybe shift our focus a little bit to the future here. What are the, some remedies? You know, how, do we, how do we take some baby steps forward on this I appreciate just first the fact that there is a Philadelphia statement, right? That you know, mm. you and others are out there making statements publicly, your name's attached to it. And so that I think is, is definitely a step uh, that's important step. But what else can we be doing on campus, outside of campus to help move the ball forward? Well, I think from an academic standpoint, I'll say a couple of things. One is that it is worth having grounded and written statements about free speech policy on campus. And I would say that for those great liberal arts institutions, especially Christian liberal arts institutions, that grounding policies, I think Matt, you said this so well before, you know, th this is about understanding the other as, a, as one created by God. And at the same time, in the, so that's the great Christian or Judeo-Christian tradition. But the great liberal arts tradition is to understand that we will come to conclusions on particular decisions or policy discussions out of debate, discussion, and persuasion, which inevitably understands that there will be disagreement and a variety of, of views expressed. And so those two things put together, I, I'm, I think actually this, I wasn't planning on saying this, to me, this needs to be the quest of Christian liberal arts higher education for the 21st century. This thing right here. Because only we have the tools available to us to fight back against the cancel culture. And, and so I think seeing this actually as a responsibility, <laughs> that this, what I would call, immoral arc of history uh, needs to be bent back. And... It would, be, it would be an immense achievement for Christian liberal arts higher education if we stared back from the year 2050 and realized, wow, you know, these were the institutions that stepped forward to say, we are, we are not going to betray, betray our trust and betray our faith by enabling, engendering, supporting this, this cancel culture. That's great. Well, thank goodness we live in, in a really easy year, Pete. So. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's go do it. All right. Yes, <laughs> all right. It's not, all right. Um, the new year coming I didn't say up. it was going to be easy, Dave. <laughs> right. All right. You gave us 30 years. so we can I know. I know. Plenty of time. 2020 uh, will end. Okay. We'll okay. see. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, in all seriousness, so we do a required reading uh, for, for every show, and that's usually left to, to me to assign the – uh, the old dusty text, uh, but you as yep. our visiting professor, um, uh, what would be a, uh, an essay that you would suggest that would be great for our 
you know, listening audience to take a look at and to, to process, digest, and, and think about. I know that we have posted in the, uh, on the website for the blog the, a couple of these pieces. One uh, comes out of our American project work. Actually, both of them do. Uh, one is that piece that I wrote before about this eggshell culture that I think is is worth understanding. Um, and then the other is a piece by Michael Hendricks, who's a friend of mine at the Manhattan Institute, who is looking at uh, these issues around loneliness and alienation and how we're, we're understanding these societal challenges so much more. And maybe ironically, we're understanding them quantitatively in ways we never did. But the responses to them are in the things that you both teach Right. I mean, and, and as is the, the namesake for this podcast, as Tocqueville understood so well, are these what we would call at American Project uh, points of connection? What are these institutions that are building connection between human beings and institutions and, and Americans and one another in a time when we, we have a deeper appreciation of how disconnected and alienated Americans are one to another? And what are the, frankly, toxic responses uh, that we've seen to that condition, which we argue, at least politically, is a, is a hyper-tribalism and, frankly, a focus on, an almost exclusive focus on our political identities as opposed to other identities that we develop at, at the more community level? Yeah, I remember... 25 years ago when Robert Putnam's essay, Bowling Alone, came out, I kind of drew attention to this whole question of, of where are we? You know, that people are, right. are doing things that they used to do together and now they're doing it alone and it's not a big deal. And, and we don't even necessarily feel the loss. This is one of the striking features of this, that some of the things that we've, the muscles we refuse to, to exercise, you know, they atrophy and, and then we, we kind of forget about it. And it just seems yeah. normal to do things online. I'm, I'm wondering some of the impact of, you know, this last seven, eight months, the Zoom calls and the, you know, sort of getting used to these things. And is it going to lead to another level of withdrawal where we say, you know, that was, that was, that was good enough. I, I, did I really need to meet in person, shake a hand? Or wasn't it convenient not to have to really get as dressed up as I otherwise would have to? And all the kinds of things that- Hop on a plane and go see someone and yeah. we can just- yeah. Right. We got, we got Zoom now. We got it all figured out and we've, you know, we figured out new teaching techniques. You know, you just wonder, does this lead us further down this path? And yet we see all these, these social ills that have been yeah. exacerbated by it. But, but some of the narrative seems to be, hey, look, this, this is pretty good. We've, we've found some new technologies that we can deploy in new ways. Where, where do you think this is all leading us, you know, in light of Hendrix's piece or other thoughts you have on, on this issue? Well, I do think that this greater awareness of the challenges of loneliness in ways that can be seen through a variety of disciplines. I think this is what one of the things from an academic standpoint that's so fascinating about this work is that whether you're talking about the economists, uh, Angus Deaton and Ann Case, who have written about these deaths of despair, seeing it from an economic standpoint, whether you're talking about uh, someone who's been affiliated with our American project, Francie Brokhammer, who's a research psychiatrist and has looked at the, the psychological impacts of alienation or loneliness, whether it's the former Surgeon General under Obama, Vivek Murtha, who's written about the health impacts, in fact, calls this, calls loneliness the number one health crisis facing America, or whether it's um, a communications researcher, I'm thinking of like a, a Sherry Turkle at MIT who's written about the implications, especially for millennials and, and Gen Y regarding uh, the challenges brought about by purely technically, technologically mediated communications, i.e. texting and social media, and how that's reduced our ability uh, to empathize with one another and, and several other social ills. I, I do think that the that the data is overwhelmingly clear that we are indeed communal beings who need one another to be around one another in person. That's not to say that as we record this, uh, it, 
in Zoom, and we're all spread across the United States as we do this right now, right. that there's not a value for technology in being able to do things like this. But you're seeing, you know, just in the, in the news currently about the anticipated regulations about how many people can gather for Thanksgiving, much less for, for Christmas, people are beginning to say, man, this is just, this is, this is craziness. Now, essentially what they're saying, more than just saying it's crazy, is they're saying this is not right. And they're saying it's not right because they miss one another. Yeah. And I think, uh, I'm sure, I'm not often critiqued for being a, a an optimist, but I think where I am on this is that there is a there's a growing awareness of how much we miss one another, and and so I think there could be a silver lining here at the end of all this. You know, we've we've heard recently of a second vaccine seems to be effective and and may become available shortly. That when we get into March and April and May of next year, I mean, let's just think about that. I mean, imagine a world where we can go out to eat and even just be around strangers, much less go out to dinner with people who we know that we can travel and see friends and family and our kids can too. I mean, you know, the voice here that is not really at the table, and I, I, I know you're both parents and I am too uh, of an eight-year-old, I can only call it the suffering that she has been through and not being able to see her friends uh, right. either at church or at, or at school is something I don't think we've really taken a full accounting of, of the impact on that generation in the you know, preteen and teen range specifically. So my hope is that we don't come to this conclusion at the end that, wow, you know, hey, we got Zoom, we can do all these things, we don't have to fly so much. But we realize anew how much we need one another. You know, just a last note on that. This, I was talking to a really good friend of mine from high school uh, the other day who lives in Chicago, works for a major investment bank, and travels usually is in the air three days a week, right? They have a daughter, very successful. And he said, Pete, you know, what I've learned over these last six months is I'm not going back to that old life anymore. You know, I, I am not going to travel three days a week anymore. And, you know, this Zoom has enabled me to be able to do some things that I just never thought would be possible. And so what's happening there is rather than saying, you know, I don't, I don't need to meet with people because of Zoom. He's now saying, actually, I'm going to be able to spend more time at home. Right. Because of Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, because some of the research is showing that as well, that, that this not going in into the office is allowing and enabling many of us to spend more time at home. Um, that's certainly not true of everyone, but I, I do think that there is a greater appreciation of, of those things. If we could get to a point where we, we see the value in those places, that the meetings that we don't have to travel for, and then still be able to cherish that time and community together, I mean, I think you made a great point at, at the beginning of your remarks on this, that there's a connection between these two issues, that as, as, we, as we do more without connections with other people, we kind of turn people into abstractions. And it's easy mm. when they're on Twitter or social media or even, even in Zoom, maybe in some ways, to yeah. not see the three-dimensional person and the qualities that are the non-political, the, the non-controversial, right? to, to see them as somebody that I can enjoy a good joke with, even if we happen to disagree on the presidential election. And so you know, I, I fear that by the emphasis that's been put on this digital communication, it's, it's kind of allowed us to, to turn people into something less than fully formed humans, and, and certainly in a heightened political season anyway, you're going to have an emphasis on that which divides rather than that which unites. And hopefully with, with your optimism there, we're, we're going to see <laughs> some, some turnaround on this, right? In the next six months, maybe we'll just sort of naturally come out of this and say, oh, you know what? I like you after all. <laughs> you know, it's, it's good to shake a hand. It's good to have a, yeah. have a hug, you know, yeah. and to have that kind of, yeah, just run into people at the mall, right? It kind of yeah. places it. I don't enjoy going, but the mall might be a fun place to go next summer. Well, I have to say just, I mean, 
think about this, you know, for those of us who are people of faith, you know, we, we started, my wife and I and our daughter started going to a, a local congregation church here in, in the Malibu area only because they were still meeting in person. Now, this was a very small group of 25 or 30 people, and that's how they were able to do it. Can you provide the address of that church right now? <laughs> the authorities in California. I honestly don't know how they're doing it. I okay. really don't know how they're yeah. doing it. All right. But I will say that it, it, it was, I remember going there for the first time after, you know, five months of, or four months, I guess, at the time of online church. And I didn't know anybody there. It wasn't the, the denomination that I usually attended, but my goodness, was it great to be around other people. And, and again, I, I hope that those are the realizations because frankly, some of the data right now is not great. The drop in church attendance that we've seen that's highlighted in that Hendricks piece that we mentioned before, yeah. uh, all the other factors around, frankly, suicides and uh, depression and all of those, all of those trend lines are going in a negative direction. But I, I do remain hopeful that human nature is a persistent thing. It's one of the interesting things about the Hendricks piece is that he ends on a high note with a, with a charge where he comes full circle and, and kind of suggesting what you've suggested, which is that we miss that private communion. There may be an opportunity for a public spiritedness or, or public communion thereafter. He, he says the charge to every American during this pandemic of COVID-19 should be to ask what particular role is my community asking me to play? It could be to serve, to give, to care, or to cure. And so there's an openness perhaps to, to others that is so needed in the public sphere as well. You know, so perhaps a, a COVID-inspired uh, Tocquevillian individualist, individualism has driven us back uh, to become public spirited once again. Well, and I'd say this on that note, David, is that I think there has also been nas- nationwide a civics lesson. And, and, and to be more specific about it, I get a chance, my freedoms are not dictated by the federal government nor the state government right now. They're dictated, and they're not even dictated by elected county officials. They're dictated by the director of the LA, Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. I think people, uh, I'm sure millions of people here in Los Angeles County are now realizing that they don't just live in America, nor do they just live in California. They live in Los Angeles County. And so that that focus on decisions that are being made at a very local level, having significant impact on where they live and work and whether they can work, I do think at least opens the door to a realization that our focus going forth from here really should be on the local level, as opposed to a, a complete and utter focus on what's ever happening uh, nationally or federally. Yeah, there's so much opportunity, obviously, for the average person to be involved and to make a difference in those ways. And whether it's in a directly political way or just sort of a community building way. But, you know, for most of us, Washington is an interesting pastime. Yeah. But, but we're, not, we're, we're not really players in the game. We're, and that's such a great point, Matt. I mean, again, I like the way you put it, pastime, because in that, there's an understanding that politics and maybe even more broadly civic engagement is meant to be a spectator sport. No one greater than Tocqueville to say that that just does not cut it. Uh, Pete, really loved uh, what you've had uh, to say uh, referencing Tocqueville and others. Uh, some might say that that doesn't really sound conservative. And here you are uh, helping direct the American project on American conservatism. What type of conservatism do you see perhaps forming in the country in the 21st century along the lines of what you've discussed, responding to uh, loneliness, uh, promoting civility, public discourse, free speech, et cetera? Well, the, the project itself, which is uh, which I co-direct with someone named Rich Taffel, who's based in D.C., uh, has become a group of activists, academics, and, and policymakers all on the right wrestling with these questions about the future of the movement. We first gathered in the wake of the 2016 election in the spring of 2017 
And I have to say, it was, it was the hardest thing that I've ever done professionally. Uh, we had about 40 people together. We had pretty hardcore libertarians from Cato. We had social conservatives from Heritage. We had neocons from AEI. I mean, we, we had people that were really all over the map on the right side of the spectrum. And what was so wonderful about that long weekend experience that we convened here on campus, which I don't know if I mentioned is in Malibu. Uh, <laughs> you did mention that. Uh, did, okay. I, did I say that? Um, is that, uh, is it the challenges that we were facing as a, as a political culture were not so much political in policy, they were cultural. And, and that cultural challenge was this loneliness, which we've been talking about. And so how do you respond to that? And so what rolled out of that realization was this deeper awareness that there is a long strain within the conservative intellectual movement uh, known as communitarianism, uh, which goes back to Burke and goes straight through the uh, 19th century. I don't think we would call uh, Tocqueville a communitarian, as a communitarian, but at the same time, he definitely did outline that this is very much in keeping with the with American identity that he had witnessed, um, and certainly goes through the 20th century and now into the 21st, in which, in some ways, opposed to a, a more hardcore libertarianism, communitarianism sees the importance of local institutions, organic institutions, organic change and progress coming out of those identity being built at a more local level and and out of geography, as opposed to out of race or ethnicity, at least being built more out of that, out of geography. This is, this is the way we see this reimagined communitarianism being an effective response to this era of, of loneliness and alienation. And so the work of the project, and it's not just rhetorical, I mean, there, there is a whole set of uh, policies, public policies that roll out of that, but it does start with this fundamental understanding that human nature is, is communal, and, but an awareness that we're looking out at a culture marked by this pervasive disconnection. And so finding ways to respond to that, again, in, in ways that are very Tocquevillian in nature, is, is the work that we're doing through this American project. That's great. Where could people go to find, uh, what, is there a website or yeah. archives that people could go and hear the, what's going on, essays written on this topic? What, what would those be? Those sites? Yeah, so we have an essay channel at the website Real Clear Policy. And so if you go to Real Clear uh, Policy, not politics, although it's within that family of websites, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see something called uh, Recovering the American Project. And so that that series of essays, I think we're up to 25 or 30 of them now, is there. And then if you Google search American Project and Pepperdine, you'll see all the rest of the work. There is a website as well, which is actually a student project here for our grad students at AmericanProject.org, which is essentially an aggregator of relevant content to this perspective on the future of uh, American conservatism. That's, I think that's such an important aspect of the project because, you know, you think about, as you go back to de Tocqueville, he observes people living in these little platoons, people living mm -hmm. in this local life and this community life. But he also argues the tendency of democracy is towards centralization, that those are mm -hmm. unnatural artificial things. Those are things that are really carried over from a previous way of life. And as you project the future from there, He's suggesting it's going to take work, hard work, to hold on to those things. They're not going to just maintain themselves as a natural outgrowth of American democracy as you move forward into later parts of the 19th century, 20th century, and beyond. So this is the kind of thing, if, if we recognize its importance, we can't expect it to accidentally emerge. This is going to take the work of, of, of the American Project and others in cooperation who see the value of, of that local community life and the place for that in a healthy civic culture. Yeah, that's right. And we are seeing that, right? I mean, um, we hosted an event uh, over a year ago uh, on Capitol Hill. Senator Mike Lee happens to lead something called the Joint Economic Committee, and he tra has transformed what has been a pretty technocratic and mundane policy research group 
into something called the Social Capital Project. And so for those that are interested in even how federal policy can enable, engender, and encourage these more communitarian responses in policy, Google searching Joint Economic Committee or Social Capital Project, there really are some exciting things happening there on the policy side uh, around these principles. Pete, thank you so much uh, for for coming on the show. Uh, Would love to have you back again in 2050. (laughs) See whether your prediction, uh, your optimism uh, proved true, but, uh, but really, uh, thank, thank you so much and uh, really, really appreciated your thoughts. They were great and, and very timely given where we are. So thank you, sir. Great to be with you both. Love this show. All right, thanks very much. And just a reminder to our listeners, you can always subscribe and review the podcast at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and Stitcher. And we'll look forward to talking to you again next week.